when he set a goal, uh, he never let go of it. And the end result is where he is today. If you can go through life and count on one hand the number of real friends that you have, it's a lot. I consider Mike that friend. He's wonderful. I mean, he's a great father. One of the things that he's taught all of us is how to address problems head on, straightforward, how to deal with everything that comes our way. He gives you the ability to, to rise to levels that you didn't really think were within your own spirit. Um, he can certainly see people's potential long before they do. They say that girls marry their dads, and I think I married my dad. Mike is funny, he's caring, family and, and friends are very dear to him. He's a great guy, and my dad always liked him, so uh, that's something I hold dear. The story of Michael Farrell begins with another Michael Farrell, his father. In 1936 at 16, Michael John Farrell began a 10-year enlistment in the Irish Guards, the celebrated British Army Regiment from the Republic of Ireland. During World War II, Michael Farrell saw combat in several theaters of operation. One desperate scene was played out very early in the conflict. Operation Dynamo, the evacuation of Dunkirk. In June of 1940, a cornered Allied expeditionary force of 300,000 had its back to the English Channel in northeastern France. A rear guard battle was being fought to stem the German advance. On the beach, British and French troops were shelled and strafed relentlessly. The Allies were on the brink of annihilation when Prime Minister Winston Churchill ordered British ships, large and small, to cross the channel to Dunkirk to rescue the army. As these vessels of every kind arrived, exhausted troops swam out to meet them. My dad basically strips off his equipment, gets into the water, and swims out to a boat. Well, the, the guys on the boat were British, and they wouldn't let my dad on because he was Irish. <laughs> so they told him, get off the boat. He had to swim to a boat where there were Irish guys. So there was even prejudice in foxholes back then. Michael returned to England after his rescue and later went on to drive armored vehicles under Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery in North Africa. There he was wounded when a mine exploded under his tank. It was an eye injury. His sight would never be the same again. After the war, Michael Farrell decided his young family, wife Vera and baby son Tom, should leave Europe for a new beginning outside the British Isles. Despite the tempting imperial offer of free land to veterans who would settle in Australia, Michael followed the call of America. He arrived in 1947, wife and child a few months later aboard the Queen Mary. The Farrells settled in Brooklyn. Vera was a housewife, and Michael worked as a union man, waterproofing and caulking the rising post-war New York City skyline. Sheila Lavelle was a close friend of the Farrells, and still lives in the Bay Ridge neighborhood. Great people, great hardworking people, honest, wonderful. Vera went to church every day, very religious. Uh, Wednesday was her big day, novena in all pH to our mother of perpetual health. Her big thing was her family, very dedicated to her family knew what every one of them was doing at all times. Mike did everything to make a dollar. He worked, did a lot of construction work, painted. He did everything. He had a big family. He worked very, very hard. Steady work was important as the family was growing. After Tom came Barbara in 1948. And then Michael Austin John Farrell was born in Brooklyn on April 10th, 1951. Very quiet little boy with a very poor appetite. I remember as a child all he would eat would be peas and bologna and my mother was always fretting about his weight and health. 
thinking that he'd never grow or he'd never expand. He was always skin and bones. I remember Mike as a skinny, skinny little kid and short. Now he's a big, tall guy, I'm sure. But young Michael eventually got enough to eat, and the boy took root in Brooklyn along with his six siblings. In the middle 50s, we moved into uh, the house that I consider where I grew up, which was on 59th Street and 7th Avenue in Brooklyn. Back then, it was called Bay Ridge. It was a three family with a, we had an Italian uh, shoemaker at the bottom and, uh, and two, two apartments upstairs. At first, there was a shoemaker downstairs, which my father renovated that floor and then made that into an apartment. But we lived in every one of those floors. So sometimes, in the shoemaker apartment, there was only two bedrooms, so the four boys shared one room and then the three girls shared the other and then mom and dad were on the pullout couch. <laughs> the Farrells were able to buy their house through a system of loose-knit financial agreements, not uncommon in immigrant neighborhoods at the time. It was like private mortgages, really, between families. And uh, actually, our backers were the Coonies and the Kinsellas, uh, who uh, basically wrote a mortgage for my parents to buy a house that they owned. And I can remember uh, very clearly my mother pushing my younger brothers and sisters around in carriages, first down to Smitty's Bar and Grill to see my dad, who ended up having a beer after work, um, and getting his paycheck, and then walking over to the Cooney's house and making the monthly payment. There was a, always a sense of neighborhood and community. But life in Brooklyn's Irish, Polish, and Italian immigrant communities of the 1950s centered around the Roman Catholic parish. To young Mike Farrell and his family, that meant the church and parochial school one block away, Our Lady of Perpetual Help. Back in those days, it was typical 1950s nuns, kind of uh, dominated classrooms. You had 50 kids, but for some reason, we could get along with that because the nuns were so dominating with their rulers and erasers and had great aim that they could take care of, you know, just about any army. Like many Irish immigrants, Mike's father worked second and third jobs to pay the tuitions and the mortgage, which he burned, incidentally, in just 10 years. His work ethic was, work is prayer. If you're doing what you want to do and you're doing, doing it you know, for the betterment of mankind, even if you're fixing roofs like we were in Brooklyn, uh, then you're doing a good job. Mike learned this lesson and showed early signs of his future business acumen. I was lucky enough to get a Patty Playpal doll that was about the same size as me, but she had met with misfortune against the radiator in the apartment building. So Mike, one of his first um, entrepreneurial <laughs> positions, decided that she was going to be the horror show for the community. So he put her up in the top bunk bed with a flashlight on her burnt face and put her in a turtleneck and charged people admission to come in and see this horrible doll. <laughs> Mike entered Bishop Ford High School in Park Slope in 1964. It was a new school built for all the baby boomers. There were no seniors when we went to the class. We were freshmen, there were sophomores, there were juniors. There had never been a graduating class. Although Mike enjoyed sports and speech class at Bishop Ford, his life remained centered around his home parish. After the Second Vatican Council permitted such things, Mike started a folk group that played at OLPH masses and at nearby churches as well. But Mike wasn't all clean cut. There was a mischievous side, as demonstrated one Christmas Eve at a midnight mass performance. Mike unfortunately overdid it with the rum and coke before we ever got to church for midnight mass. And uh, you definitely could tell once mass got started, he got lost. Sister Margaret Helena was a little slow to catch on to this. Sorry to say, he did get sick and all. I really enjoyed art and music at the time. He was also involved in the Parish Center for Kids and the communion of the community. He even entertained the notion of entering the priesthood, but he had to finish high school first. I wasn't a particularly good student, and I wasn't really, uh, you know, I wasn't really excited about going to school every day. As my parents could tell you, it was always a war for me to go to school. Meantime, Mike's father had his own plans for his son. My dad um, and I were always knocking heads because, you know, in our mainstream of life, you wanted to be a union member. You wanted to work for the police force. You wanted to work for the fire department. In his mind, that was guaranteed life and employment, and you were stupid if you didn't want to do it. Um, and in our, in our case, we everyone took the tests back then, you know, the... Uh, 
you always went down and you took the police test and the fire test and the sanitation test. That's basically what our neighborhood did. That's where you knew you had a pension for the rest of your life. And to my father, that was a very important component, uh, knowing that you would have a pension after 20 years or 25 years. So after graduating from Bishop Ford in 1968, Mike took the police force exam and scored very well. When his father saw his son's score published in The Chief, the city's municipal workers' newspaper, he proudly declared his son's intention to enter the New York City Police Academy. Well, I didn't sign the book to go to the academy at the end of the test because I couldn't see myself as a cop, and I was afraid to tell him. My mother had to break him that news. Uh, so th there was weeks where he didn't want to talk to me after that happened. <laughs> as you can imagine, that was sort of like a public disgrace. My father couldn't understand what I was doing, but my mother, on the other hand, saw a different side of me. My mother really just gave me what I consider the greatest gift that any parent can give their kids, which is the freedom to fail and to go out and try and flap your wings and see what happens. My mother's thing was is you should pursue your own vision of what you think is, is, is life and that you shouldn't be afraid to try new things and that you might fail. So I identified more strongly with her. I would still say that that's a very powerful influence. My path was different than what my dad expected it to be. It's 1971. The war in Vietnam rages on. Young men continued to be drafted and sent to Southeast Asia. But deferments were available to college students. Mike Farrell moved west to New Mexico State University on a partial basketball scholarship. But after not quite a year, word got back to New York that Mike wanted to come home. Tom Farrell had just completed 18 months in the war zone and was finishing his enlistment in nearby Phoenix, Arizona. Got a call from my mother telling me that my brother was going to quit college and give up the scholarship. Can I fly to Albuquerque and try and talk him out of it? And I spent a few days with him and I thought he had been convinced to stay in college, but he didn't. Shortly afterwards, he left, came back to Brooklyn, and now was open for the draft. But a family friend in the National Guard encouraged Mike to join New York's Fighting 69th. Spots, however, were limited, so he offered some advice. Tell him that you're a car mechanic, because we need auto mechanics really badly right now, and uh, you know, they'll take you right away. <laughs> so I didn't know anything about cars. I didn't learn to drive until I was 20. <laughs> so when you live in Brooklyn, you walk everywhere, you take the bus or the subway. So I figured, okay, I'll learn about cars. So in 1971, I'm 21. I went into the, uh, I went into the National Guard and I did my uh, basic duty uh, down at Fort Dix, down in uh, New Jersey. And I learned how to fix Jeeps. It, it matured me. It definitely matured me because it made me focus, first off, why am I doing this, right? Uh, you know, there's a war going on and I've grown up with John Wayne movies and I'm thinking war is a glory thing. But, you know, when you go to see a few of your friends come back in boxes from Vietnam, all of a sudden the glory's gone. Now my whole view of life changes because I understand there are leveling things that go on in life. And simultaneously, uh, I begin to get an appreciation for sacrifice for the country. I'm going to wear the uniform. I'm going to go through the same thing that everybody else goes through. And there's a chance that I get called up to go do something. Although Mike could have been called to active duty and sent to Vietnam, his unit remained in New York. In 1971, National Guardsman Mike Farrell joined the management training program at the investment house E.F. Hutton. He was eventually put in charge of stock operations. Because of the courses I took in high school and college, I was the only guy in the company that knew how to use a keyboard. Right? It was still a fairly uh, unique thing for a guy to be using a keyboard back then. Mike was ultimately put in charge of the company's Vista network, the first electronic trading and accounting system on Wall Street. As a result of this work, Mike was exposed to senior management as an ambitious young executive, and he began his move up the ladder. He eventually supervised 40 people in his operations department, taking in securities, accounting for them, and paying for them. Things were looking good for Mike professionally but his tremendous optimism at work would be challenged at home. At 23, Mike married his young sweetheart. A baby daughter arrived a year later, but within six months, she developed serious health problems. Kelly Farrell's skull had no soft spots, 
The growing space had hardened prematurely. Her brain was literally outgrowing her head. Kelly faced severe mental impairment. I did a little bit of research and I found this doctor at NYU named Fred Epstein who uh, was doing experimental surgery in effect uh, to do all this stuff and his whole plan was uh, that they were going to shave off her hair, they were going to open up her skull, they would kind of cut the bones and then put in plastic in search. Dr. Epstein has retired since suffering a severe head injury while biking in 2001. But in 1974, he was alone in performing this pioneering procedure. At the time, it cost about $10,000. Mike Farrell's E.F. Hutton salary was $10,000 a year, and his insurance would not cover the operation. Look, if they can't pay, they can't pay. That's all. You do the operation anyway. If they can pay in a week or a month or a year, they'll pay then. If they can't, they don't. They really don't. But you have to give the best possible care you can give. Well. You know what? Fred Epstein did it. <clears throat> She's a beautiful girl. Uh, it, it was a tremendous miracle. About two years later, I finally got a $10,000 bonus and I paid him off. I'm fine. I have no ill effects at all from the surgery. I, I wouldn't even know I had it unless I had, didn't have the scars on my head. I can't imagine being a young parent and my first child and having to go through surgery. I think he appreciates fatherhood and, and the, how precious life really is. I mean, he's always been able to handle situations well. Um, he's great under pressure. And this is one point in his life where that really took hold and he had to do that. Fred Epstein's work really was a real lifesaver for me and, and showed me the generosity that people can give you. And they don't really care about where you come from or whether they'll do the right thing for the kid. It tells you a lot about life in general. Sleeping in that hospital with my daughter for, you know, six months, that was an education. And that's an education you don't get from any university, you don't get it from any prep school, you don't get it from any elementary school. That's a lifetime experience. Today when I look back, I, was, I really understand how lucky I was to find Fred and his team at NYU. It makes me feel that very, very good that Kelly is an adult woman, that she's grown up, that she's done well, it really makes me feel very, very good. With his daughter's health problems solved, Mike moved on. He joined Whedon and Company in 1977, and later Cantor Fitzgerald. At both companies, Mike worked with Jim Avina. Both recently separated, they became roommates. It was really, truly the odd couple. You know, I went completely crazy, having a newfound freedom. Mike was much more mellow, and he couldn't take all the partying and all the craziness, and he was reluctant to date. But eventually, Mike became smitten with a Cantor colleague. So again, I was served papers, not only by my first wife, but by Farrell now, <laughs> that he was gonna move out on me. A Cantor Fitzgerald receptionist introduced Mike Farrell to Mary Flynn in 1980. My first impression, I thought he was very competitive kind of standoffish, and I didn't like him. I just, because he was, he was, uh, they were closing one of the, the mortgage uh, desks, and he was like the wonder kid. He was coming in and fixing everything up. Mike has a slightly different tale of their meeting. I uh, met her at Canner, 1980, on an elevator with Bernie Canner in front of me and Mary uh, waving her hair at me, uh, in my face, as I like to say. Nevertheless, during a transit strike that crippled New York City and forced many workers to remain in Manhattan, Mary saw a softer side of Mike. He was separated at the time, and he really missed Kelly. He really didn't like that separation. He liked coming home at night and seeing her. Mike and Mary started dating. I asked him to go to my sister's wedding, and at that time, my mother didn't like the fact that he was previously married, um, didn't want to have anything to do with them. Um, my dad liked them. But Mike missed the ceremony. He was struggling with a rental car in which his new girlfriend had locked the keys. Then he missed much of the reception when in unfamiliar Long Island territory, Mike followed a car that was not going to the reception. But he eventually did show up. He had the car and he was actually the savior of the day because my dad got very drunk that day 
and Mike was able to drive us all home. Uh, and again, my mother didn't like Mike, but you know, everybody else's eye, he was the king of the day. <laughs> After a three-year courtship, Mike and Mary were married on May 29th, 1983. Through much of this time, Mike continued with his music. He was part of a few bands and even cut a demo reel. There was, you know, a bar band, and it was just someplace I think originally for Mike to blow off steam. It didn't quite catch anybody's ear, and it was it was nice writing, I guess. And that's really, I think, um, he quite tried to put music to his to his stories. After a long look at a potential music career, Mike decided to concentrate on business. Mike had originally gone to Cantor Fitzgerald as part of a Whedon team charged with saving the company after some bad market decisions. After some innovative work, Bernie Cantor wanted to recruit Mike and others for his company, but cash was tight. So we became the first shareholders outside of the Cantor family. One of the things that we did during that period was we negotiated the lease to put them up on the 105th floor of the World Trade Center. Um, and that was where Bernie wanted to be on top of the world. I'm there for about three years. And then uh, during that three year period, um, I really wanted to grow uh, and I wanted to use more of my expertise. It was really kind of, uh, looking back now, uh, part of the frustration of me wanting to be an entrepreneur, I wanted to do something different, but it was time for me to move on. And uh, I did, I went over to Merrill and I was running their back office. At 30 years of age, Mike Farrell had 200 people in his department, the youngest such executive at Merrill Lynch. No, I'm 151, he's still there. One day in 1981, Robert Schiffer, who ran the mortgage bank trading desk, paid him a visit. He had a problem. Look, we have to shut down trading here every day at 12 o'clock because we electronically can't handle all of the trade tickets that come through. And I think you can figure this mess out. Mike saw an opportunity. He wanted to move to trading, but conventional wisdom said that 30 is too old to learn the necessary skills. So he struck a deal with management. Mike promised to fix the problem in exchange for a shot at trading. He was given a budget of $4 million and a team of 20 programmers. So we went in and we created a system uh, for risk management, the first online real-time system called MAST. While working on the new system for Merrill Lynch, Mike worked closely with a budding entrepreneur whom he grew to like. So we signed a contract with Mike Bloomberg <laughs> to come in and give us the electronic capability to deliver MAST out as a trade processing system. Well, the next thing you know, Mike was in there and he was throwing everything into the Merrill system, research everything, and Merrill eventually bought part of the company because he was so deep into their electronic underwear that he had to figure out how to do it. Uh, and they had to keep him honest, I guess. By the mid-1980s, Bob Schiffer had moved to Morgan Stanley with his entire team without giving Mike his chance to trade. But Schiffer called Mike again with the same offer. If Mike would build a similar system for Morgan Stanley, he would get his chance to trade there. When we went up to Morgan Stanley, then literally in six months we had it up and running and integrated into the system. Mike started trading at Morgan Stanley, but he remained restless. He moved to L.F. Rothschild in 1987, there, he had a ringside seat to that year's stock market crash. I had built up a very big long position in mortgage-backed securities that as the stock market went down, the bond market was rallying, and we were making a ton of money on the trading position uh, that we had bought at the lows. And as that happened continually for three or four days, unfortunately, our tr stock trading desk was really getting hammered, but we couldn't hold on to the positions. Every night, we had to pare them down. After the losses of the 1987 crash, Rothschild was reeling. Mike helped clean up the company and got it into a position to operate. Meantime, he had several opportunities to go off on his own, but Mike hesitated. And my wife hated me after that because every night I was coming home and I wasn't happy. You know, I, I knew I wanted to do something on my own. I felt like uh, my capabilities were ready to do it. But when would Mike be ready to strike out on his own? 
In 1991, Mike Farrell agreed to help a Denver-based company, then known as Citadel Funding, fine-tune its high net worth business. With his knowledge of capital markets, Mike helped recreate the company by institutionalizing it. By the mid-1990s, Mike had bought out the other partners and concentrated on forming a public company. All the guys, the traditional guys on Wall Street, uh, were turning me down. Welcome to the economic recovery. But in 1996, an underwriter met with Mike Farrell and his team and admired their track record. Some capital for a domestic deal was offered by FBR of Arlington, Virginia. And I just dusted off the reprospectus that I'd written in my garage in 1992. Six weeks later, I had an engagement letter. Four months later after that, we did our private placement. And then six months after that, we were on the floor of the stock exchange ringing the bell. So, <laughs> so it was a very... Uh, quick rush to fame, if you will, from that period, but it was after years of toiling and trying to get the thing done. Anna Lee Mortgage, as it is known today, was out of the gate. However, it was difficult sailing in the beginning. Along with early victories came defeat. In 98, 99, and 2000, we were shut out from the markets. We were creating extremely generous returns, 17, 18 percent dividend yields but nobody cared because they could make that in Yahoo in 25 minutes on the internet. <laughs> so uh, for the next three years, we really couldn't grow the company. And it was a very uh, difficult time from a staffing point of view, especially because most of the people here uh, that work here uh, had really bet their lives and their livelihoods on me and my ability to make this thing work. Mike took his responsibility for the Annalise staff seriously. For a while, he was using his own personal income to support the company. But the outlook remained grim. All that Mike Farrell had worked for, the company he struggled to build, faced ruin. Things finally came to a head in the summer of 2000. Investors continued to pump money into attractive internet stocks. 400,000 three quarters, five eighths, 400,000 take. But Mike's 30 years on Wall Street told him it was not sustainable. It had to end soon, or did it? Mike confronted his staff. They had the dinner from hell in the fall of 2000 where uh, all of the grumblings and all of the, uh, the backbiting that was going on because of the inability to grow during those three years had finally gotten to me and I just uh, called a, a dinner and basically put it on the table that you're either with me or against me, but I'm gonna go to the markets back in 2001. I think that the bubble's gonna break and I think we need to prepare to do that and I intend to push the envelope right now. Mike had drawn a line in the sand. You're either gonna be here, or you're gonna work hard with me and you're gonna make this work and we're gonna grow it because I do think it's ending. Or maybe you should go do something else with your life and figure out what to do. Well, most of those people made the bet. Anna Lee was in the right place at the right time when the bubble burst. After three years of sitting with investors fruitlessly telling their story, masses of money opened up for Anna Lee in late 2000. The company went from a $100 million company to a billion dollar company in equity in one year. Against that background came the tragedy of September 11th. It's a real tribute to the American know-how that was, went into building Wall Street over the past 30 years. Because all the electronic stuff did work, all the backups did work. The net net was, is that the minute that the, um, that the markets reopened, we did the largest transaction that we did in the year. We were swamped with capital because people were now looking for that kind of strategy and a flight to quality. By the end of 2001, Annalee had gone from a microcap company to a Russell 2000 player and then to a Russell 1000 player. It was about being relentless and staying at it and also not losing your focus during the course of that. And that difficult time in 97 to 2000 was a difficult time to keep people happy, make sacrifices as the entrepreneur in the business, and make sure that the place was still going to be around in five years. The way that we approached it was to be the low-cost provider, and that's capitalism as best, creative destruction. For a guy who, who always says he doesn't have a crystal ball, uh, the experience he's gained in his years in the markets uh, have really given him a pretty good feel for, uh, for what's going to happen, and, uh, and I think it's, it's inured to all of our benefit. Now it's the spring of 2005. Mike Farrell is the chairman, CEO, and president of Annalee Mortgage Management and FIDAC, or Fixed Income Discount Advisory Company, the two companies he founded in the 1990s. Annalee Castle is the ancestral home of the Farrell family outside of Dublin. The company logo is the Farrell family crest. 
Annalee is listed on the New York Stock Exchange and is a leading player in mortgage-backed securities, arbitrage, and investment income, and is qualified as a real estate investment trust. Today we run a global business here. We have partnerships throughout China, Japan, Korea, Canada, Latin America, Switzerland. Uh, we're working on deals currently in London. The business has grown dramatically in 10 years because of those nascent things that we did way back in 92 and 93. We're trusted every day with three and a half to four billion dollars worth of equity, 34 billion dollars worth of assets and borrowing. And if I had told my wife that that would be the size and scale of this business 14 years ago, I'm sure she wouldn't have believed me. Uh, she wouldn't have understood that we're you know, a valued partner to people like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac in that respect, and that uh, we've grown the business literally from nothing to, to what it is today. But Mike wasn't alone in growing the business. And I've had the luck of really having some great people come here out of college uh, or out of early parts of their career and come work with me and, and buy off on that and make that bet with me and enhance the bet. You know, take their vision. And I pass along the same thing that I like to say my mom passed along to me. Give this a shot. Try it. You fail, there's no stigma. It's so long as it's all part of, you know, trying to make the thing better. If it doesn't work out, we'll understand. You can go back and do what you did before and we'll figure it out. There's no, there's no penalty for trying. The penalty is for not trying. He doesn't place too much emphasis on a lot of things that other traditional Wall Street firms might place the same emphasis on. And I think that's part of the reason why he is such a great judge of character and has spawned this very successful company from nothing where a lot of others might not have done so well. But yes, he looks at the, the whole organization as his family. I'm proud of what's been built here, but I don't accept personal ownership for it. I, I recognize it's a team effort. Um, the people that work for me, I mean, they have surpassed the master. They, they are truly, I got to tell you, there are some really smart people here I come to work with every day. It's part of the great joy of being here. Um, these people are really smart people that I'm going to turn the reins over to when I'm ready to go because they can run this company. They've been running it all along. But at the end of the day, where is my career taking me? It's taking me from the back office where I learned how to fix the car to the middle office where I learned how to trade all the assets that go with it and then to run it from the front end. And I'm one of the few guys that you'll run into in this business who has that bottom thing. I can't tell you how many times my back office experience has paid off in saving me all these years. And one day I could be sitting on top of the world and the next day I could be at the bottom of the pit, but I know how to get back up. All of the people that work for me, one thing that they have in general is that they're all jocks in mentality. They all know how to get knocked down and they all know how to get back up because the grace is not in how many times you fall, it's in how many times you rise. Today, Mary and Mike Farrell's lives revolve around the community of Summit, New Jersey. They have three children, Caitlin, Michael, and Taylor. I love my dad because he taught me how to jam. Mike is very active in coaching all his children as well. Every night, basically, including tonight, I'll be in a gym somewhere uh, or I'll be on a field somewhere, uh, you know, involved with kids at that level. So that, that's followed over from, being, from growing up. We won a championship when our boys were in the eighth grade. And I think the kids kind of came out and had fun. Mike always made sure that they were having fun. While coaching is important, the Farrell's philanthropy is paramount. Mary works for several women's and children's charities in New Jersey, and for Mike, giving has become a way of life. But... Mike's philanthropic bones go beyond just the monetary side. He's looking for the welfare of as many people that come in contact with his life, yet his priorities are really set correctly, and those priorities are family and friends first. Um, and to me, he's the true definition of what a friend is all about. Me and my wife try to teach the kids that it's not just about work, it's also about charity, it's about mercy, it's about caring for other people, it's about doing things and making your projects work, you know, for the betterment of people is a really good thing to do. I think we both feel blessed in what we do have, but we would like to spread the wealth. Um, and you have to give back. I think education is very important to both of us. The Farrells have been particularly active at Young Mike School in Summit, Oratory Prep. We've totally renovated the school in three years. We've, uh, we've done it without adding any debt. We've 
gone to the college model of the endowment funding uh, tuitions. We've kept it middle class. It's not a Masters of the Universe kind of setup. Uh, the kids that come in there come from Newark, they come from all over the state to be educated by mostly lay people who are following the Catholic tradition now, led by a few clergy. Mike Farrell remains dedicated to his family and his charities, and he has big plans in store for them in his retirement. Meantime, he likens his life in business and at home thus far to a roller coaster ride. Sometimes you're going to be up, sometimes you're going to be down, but you have to measure both those things. My personal life was the same way. I've had that same roller coaster, I've had disappointments, and I've had victories. I can look them both in the eye and say, you're not that much different. Marrying Mary Flynn was a clear victory. I love him because he's a great guy. <laughs> he is, he's, he's the best. He's fun to be with. As he says he wants on his tombstone, he was fun while he lasted. <laughs> um, he is caring. He um, is a great dad great husband, great brother, great friend. He's just all around wonderful. The King. <laughs> but the King never forgot the Brooklyn neighborhood from which he rose, nor the struggle of his immigrant parents. Mike's father, Michael, died in May 1986 at 66 years old. He was a heavy smoker his whole life, and you just always knew that one day they were going to take him in, open him up, and then send him home, and that's very, pretty much what happened. But in his waning months, my wife became a bridge between me and him. For some reason, he could talk to her, and that would you know, mollify any kind of arguments between the two of us, and that started in the middle 80s, so to speak. Um, and then by the time he was dying, you know, I went through the death watch like most families do, uh, and got to spend time with him at the end. And, uh, we got to clear the air about a lot of things before he passed on. Mother Vera died in April of 1990. Mike attributes his success to them both. I had the grace of a great middle class existence. I consider this as sort of the fulfillment of my parents' ambitions. You know, they wanted a better life for their kids. I don't think they really would have understood the, the length and breadth of what's happened to me. Uh, I think they would have a very difficult time intellectually understanding because it, it would just be so foreign to them. They'd be happy for me, but it would be a very difficult thing for them to understand. During our honeymoon, we met my parents over in Dublin in 1983. And uh, after having a couple of beers with my dad, I said, thanks for leaving because the world that I would have grown up in there would not have afforded me the opportunities that I have here. I'm fulfilling really the, the gamble that they took in 1948 to come over here and make life better.